Hi everyone, Chris here. Just wanted to let you know that this season of The Wild, we're bringing you three new things. Along with the launch of our series On Location in America's National Parks, we're also presenting interviews with the sharpest minds in wildlife conservation. And we'll dip into our archives to share some of our favorite wild episodes from the past. Enjoy. What a wild sound. It's a wolf, and it's howling right into a remote wildlife camera. It's just 60 seconds of grainy nighttime footage on the side of a trail in the mountains. It's a sound that seems to just cut through to some ancient connection inside us. And here, it's a sound from the past, until very recently. All across America, wolves were exterminated, poisoned, trapped, and shot. There were once one million of them, but white settlers killed them for bounties and pelts, until there were only a few thousand left in the whole country. It was no different here in Washington state. Every wolf was gone by the 1930s along with a whole community of carnivores, grizzly bears, wolverines, fishers, and more. So this howl is a very special one gives me goosebumps because it's the call of one of just a handful of pioneering wolves that are coming back to this place near where I live. A corner of the world that's been without them for so long. North Cascades National Park. It's less than a thousand square miles in size, but this park is the core of a wild area that's much bigger, part of an ecosystem that's the size of Vermont. Neglected and abused, this ecosystem is beginning to transform. A whole community of animals is slowly returning, with the wolf at the apex. This is their incredible story, and the story of one lone wolf in particular, whose unlikely return is destined to change the very ecology of this wild park, and the creatures and people who've called it home. From KUOW in Seattle and Chris Morgan Wildlife, welcome to the wild. In 2017, a black wolf showed up on the western side of the Cascade Mountains, close to where I live. No one knew where he came from, but this was big news. Wolves had disappeared from this area almost a century ago. He was radio collared and tracked for a while, but then his collar slipped off and he disappeared. But it has always been on my mind, the possibility of a wolf, and so close. But of course, the chances of seeing a wolf are extremely low. I probably have a better chance of finding Bigfoot. One day, I was hiking with a friend, heading down a valley towards the North Cascade National Park, and I saw it. Something I wouldn't have expected in a thousand years. I think this is a wolf track. I'm almost 100% sure this is a wolf track. That ain't no big dog and there's no dogs around here. We're in the National It's five inches across, pressed into the sand. And there are more of them, trotting in a straight line across a sandy stretch of riverbed. That is incredible. If this is a North Cascades wolf, that's a very rare thing. There's only one known this side of the mountain range. One individual wolf, and this could be him. North Cascades National Park straddles the Cascade mountain range, but for a wolf to make the journey from the east side of the mountains here to the west side, 
They'd have to cross miles and miles of valleys bisected by rugged mountains, deep snow, glaciers, and dense forests in every direction. If you can't go up and over a mountain, you've got to go around it. It's a landscape that's pretty much impossible for any person to cross by foot. I admired the tenacity of this wolf, my wolf as I liked to think of him, and he became somewhat of an obsession for me. I don't believe it. It's my wolf. Following an elk. I kept hiking to the same place, and I kept finding his tracks. This is three times now I've been here, looking for these tracks, looking for this wolf. Three times I've found his tracks. Look at that. I reported all my findings to the National Park Service and the state biologists. My exact latitude and longitude location, photos and measurements of the tracks. I learned that he'd been caught on camera too, on and off. For a time, there was even a female with him. One of the biologists, excited by my sighting, was Jason Ransom. He's been following my wolf too, monitoring its return and what it means for this recovering ecosystem in and around North Cascades National Park. I wanted to better understand what the wolf's return means and the role it plays in the national park. So Jason agreed to meet up. Got to be careful on this road. There's a chance there's black ice on this road this morning. Seems slippery. Yeah. So today, I'm back in the North Cascades, this time with my producer, Lucy. We meet at 7 a.m. on an icy cold morning in late December at the southern edge of the wolf's home range. I'm keeping the location secret for the wolf's safety. The roads are slick. There was a huge Pacific Northwest rainstorm a couple of days ago and now it's turned to ice. Whenever I'm on this road, it's like you get into the mindset of the wolf. I just become on high alert, looking around, thinking any bend that I come around on this road, there could be a wolf standing there in the middle of the road. It's not impossible. We're definitely in the zone here. From the the highway that crosses the North Cascades, it's a 23-mile drive through Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest, like a buffer of federal land that surrounds the national park. The asphalt turns to gravel and muddy potholes. Each mile that we drive, we get deeper and deeper into wolf territory. Huge Douglas fir trees tower over us. Torrents of white water pour down from the mountainsides. It's where the Cascades got their name. The forests feel primal, dripping with saturated mosses hanging from the trees. Finally, we arrive at the trailhead. We pull into an empty parking lot covered in ice to meet Jason. The clouds have lifted. Morning, Jason. How's it going? Good, how you doing? Good. I can't believe we have blue sky. Yeah, it's a beautiful day. I'm yeah. glad it worked out this way. Thanks for being here and yeah. doing this. Jason Ransom yeah. is a wildlife biologist with North Cascades National Park. We actually know each other a bit through our grizzly bear work, but it's my first time in the field with him, and I'm psyched. What do you think the chances are of us seeing a wolf today? <laughs> it's never zero. <laughs> I can't tell if that's optimistic or not. <laughs> well, I think it's optimistic. I think, you know, it, nature always surprises you. It's, it's never zero. Uh, I'll, I can work with that. It's extremely low. You don't come to North Cascades National Park to see a wolf. Like I said before, it's practically impossible. Wolves are elusive, and the landscape makes it tough. It's not Yellowstone with its wide open valleys. This place is steep, rocky, and dark with trees. So unless you get lucky with tracks, there's really only one way to document any wolves that are finding their way back. Jason has set up cameras deep inside the park, and in the past, they've captured moments of my wolf. We'll be checking them today. North Cascades National Park is a wild place. It's one of the least visited national parks in the lower 48. One reason is that there's only one main highway that cuts through it. 
So access is often like this, a slog on foot for miles. Gives us plenty of time to chat and get to know each other more. And think about the journey my wolf might have taken to get here. For thousands of years, wolves flourished here among indigenous tribes of the Pacific Northwest, like the Upper Skagit, the Nooksack, and the Lummi. Wolves were a part of Native American life. Legends and rituals revolved around them, shaping human culture and shaping the ecosystem as a top carnivore, maintaining a balance in a place that thrived. But white settlers disrupted this balance in the 1800s, pushing Native Americans from their lands. Trappers and hunters decimated the wolf population. Cascade wolf pelts were a hot commodity. 1826 to 1867, so roughly four decades, Hudson Bay Company shipped 15,000 wolf pelts out of the North Cascades. Wow. 15,000. Oh my God. That's roughly the same size as the population of all of North America right now. And they exported that just from the North Cascades. So it's That's hard insane. for anything to survive that kind of assault, right? Yeah. On top of that, private landowners and farmers baited and trapped the wolves, worried they would kill their livestock. The federal government even sponsored an extermination program. It's highly incentivized. You know, it's cash money. It's a job. Go kill a wolf, I'll give you money. Like, that's an industry at that point. Mm -hmm. And it would pull people into these high mountains and these creeks yeah. and and yeah. thrashing through the brush to do that, to make money by killing exactly. wolves. Exactly, exactly. By the 1930s, there wasn't a wolf left in the North Cascades. Every one of them had been killed or driven out. It was 2008 when the very first wolves officially returned to Washington State, on the east side of the Cascades. But the headlines were shocking. A pair of wolves had made it into the state from Canada, and they settled near a little town called Twisp. Conservationists celebrated. It looked like a big turning point in the history of wolves here. But many ranchers weren't so thrilled. They saw the endangered wolves as a threat to their livelihood. It led to some heated conversations in local communities. Sometimes the vilification toward wolves went beyond conversation, far beyond. Like the time a FedEx driver found blood dripping from a large package he was picking up. The police were called in and discovered a partially frozen animal pelt inside the box. DNA revealed it was one of the pioneering wolves. It had been killed by a local rancher's son and boxed for shipment to a friend in Canada by the rancher's wife. On the shipping form, she labelled it as a rug. Given a chance, wolves from that first pack could potentially have made it over to the west side of the mountains, a journey of 50 miles or less from Twisp. But it wasn't to be. Other wolves gradually made it through, coming in from Canada and Idaho, but it wasn't until 10 years later that suddenly one lone black wolf appeared on the western side of the North Cascade Mountains. And waiting for him were Jason's cameras. From the science brain, my first thought was, what took you so long? I'm glad you finally got here. They provided photographic evidence of a recolonizing wolf. The non-science part of my brain, I was just really excited. I was really excited to have a homecoming of sorts for an animal that used to live here, and it's finally back. A couple of years later, Jason and other biologists made another hopeful discovery. A female had somehow found the male wolf. They knew it was a female because she was pretty cooperative on the remote camera. And then the female rolled over, which was really helpful. <laughs> um, she had a good scratch right in front of the camera, and we were for sure it was a female. Uh, that's handy. Very handy. It's super so, cooperative. Sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, that's awesome. The female disappeared a while later, but Jason still returns to the cameras regularly, every few months, trying to monitor any wolves that may have made it here. They're a protected species, and they're an ecological keystone species too, meaning that they have a big influence on the ecosystem. But to get to the cameras inside North Cascades National Park, it's five miles one way in, through rugged trails, fallen trees, and across a gushing river. 
It's become a rare sunny day in the Washington winter, and after an hour of hiking, a huge snowy peak emerges. Wow, look at that view. Wow. Sun breaking through. Oh. That's the Pacific Northwest right there. Some yeah. low hanging, low yeah. hanging fog and sun hitting the snow-capped peaks. Crystal clear water flowing from the mountains. It looks turquoise down here, doesn't it? Yeah, that's the glacial flower coming in. That's a gorgeous spot. Okay, keep on moving. It took over 80 years for the wolf to return to the west side of the North Cascades. So it begs the question, how did that first black wolf make it back? Well, when they disperse, you know, usually they don't go that far, you know, 50 to 100 miles. Um, but they tend to disperse toward places with other wolves. But here we're on the edge, right? So this is a place where there's not a bunch of occupied territories. So for a wolf to disperse this way, you know, they have to really be exploring. Wolves are pack animals, usually in family groups of four to 10 individuals. And they mostly like to stay close. They hunt together and keep each other protected. But this wolf, the one that made it back here, it strayed away from its pack. At some point, you have to stop generalizing that a wolf is a wolf and you have to think about it's an individual. And so maybe that wolf is the kind that's, you know, bold and curious and let's go mess around and find out. And they show up in the North Cascades to see what's going on here. An adventurous individual might break out to find a new life, search for a mate and breed. All of these things have to fall together for a wolf population to start growing somewhere new. Imagine if you're a single person on a dating app and there's nobody on it, and then one day there's one person on it. That's your choice, right? And so that's like being on the edge of a wolf range is, is, is probably a lot like that. That really puts it into perspective. <laughs> the wolf Tinder app. So why does it matter that the wolves are coming back? Well, there's a couple of parts to that. I mean, they're part of this ecosystem that we lost. So coming back is an important piece of the biodiversity and biodiversity is our critical tool for dealing with change that's coming. Having more species out there, more biodiversity, makes an ecosystem stronger as a whole. There are gonna be some winners and some losers, but the more species that are a part of the system, the more robust that system is, and the more resilient it is to future changes in environmental conditions. Imagine making a meal from a recipe with two ingredients. It sure is noticeable when one of them's missing, but if there are 20 ingredients, each adding something to the flavor, the recipe is tastier for it, and it doesn't matter if you forget to add one. So the more players you have, the more likely you are to keep playing the game. So wolves are a big piece of that. Grizzly bears are a big piece of that. We look at large carnivores as sort of a barometer for how things are doing out there. Because if wolves are making it, then odds are pretty good that the deer are doing okay. But the wolves wouldn't be here. And it's not just that the wolves are one piece. They affect the other pieces too in what's called a trophic cascade. They influence a chain of events in the ecosystem. You might have heard the Yellowstone story of wolves coming back in the 1990s. The ripple effect they had on so many species, from insects to big mammals. Jason says it'll happen in other national parks too, like Colorado, where wolves are also starting to come back. You know, in Great Sand Dunes and in, in Rocky Mountain, you, know, you see these winter groups of elk that are hundreds, 500, 600, even 800, one time I counted, uh, elk in a group. And their impact on the environment is very different when there's wolves around because the wolves scatter those into smaller groups. And so instead of all the elk just chowing down all the willow in the river valley, they're scattered around. And so it changes the ecosystem structurally uh, just by having wolves back. What happens when the elk are moving? So when the elk are moving, it gives the willow a chance to actually height release. It'll grow again and get higher, which then 
changes the habitat for species like beavers that come in that are feeding on willows along river valleys. All those things sort of have that cascading effect. More willow growth means more insect life, more perches and food for songbirds, more shade that cools streams for fish to thrive. And of course, beavers love willow, so they come in and create ponds where all kinds of new life can thrive. We don't have big elk herds here in the North Cascades, but there are some, and plenty of deer, hares, marmots. Jason says it's just a matter of time before we see how wolves affect things here. What that looks like in the North Cascades, we don't know. You know we don't know until wolves really reestablish. Certainly from our hike, there seems to be a lot to eat here. Every few hundred feet, we come across tracks of all kinds of different animals in the snow. These are hair tracks, right? Yeah, that's a snowshoe hair. Yeah, front and rear. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, coming right yeah. down the trail in front of us here. Is there uh, now we got some black-tailed deer tracks. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yes, nice. So that's wolf wolf prey. They look fresh as well. Three miles into our hike, and we arrive at a significant boundary. Here's a monumental moment in the trip. Stepping into. North Cascades National Park. Nice! It's nothing grand, that's for sure. Just a little wooden stake on the side of the path, marking the border of the park. On one side, it says National Forest, and on the other side, it says North Cascades National Park. You can walk right past it. Now I'm in the park, just like that. That's the park boundary right there. This is where you clock in, probably, right? Yeah, great. <laughs> So from here on in, it's all National Park looking that way. Looking basically north, are we here? Looking basically north, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it doesn't look much different than what we just walked through. The forest looks the same on both sides. If the stake wasn't there, I wouldn't even know we were crossing into a national park. The wolf might not notice either. Not right away, at least. They're legally protected as an endangered species in the whole state of Washington. So hunting them or harming them in any way here is off the table. So it's got me wondering, what actually changes for a wolf once it walks across that border into the national park? Well, what changes for the wolf is that everything else here is protected. Mm. Not just the wolf, but there's nobody hunting deer over on this side of the line. And that's what wolves are eating. The wolf is protected as a species across the state, but it doesn't mean its ecosystem is, right? Not at all. And then you get into the park and hey presto, it is protected here. I mean, and when you're outside of the park, wolves and humans are in some ways competitors for the same food. If people are out there hunting deer and elk for food, that's the same thing the wolf's looking for. And here it's just the territory for the wolf. As we step over the line, I think about that. The National Park protects everything over on this side, every creature, plant, and rock. So the park protects the wolf, and in return, the wolf will help to bring back a natural balance to the park's ecosystem and into the massive, wild 13,000 square mile North Cascades ecosystem beyond. Getting back to this diverse, healthy ecosystem brimming full of native species is something that Scott Schuyler wants too. His tribe has been a part of this place for a very long time. One of the best indicators for uh, the environment it being in a healthy spot is the fact that uh, we have wildlife and they're being sustained. That's the best indicator that uh, we're doing okay. More on the story of wolves and healing in this recovering national park after the break. Have you seen wolves in the wild anywhere? I don't think I have, to be honest with you, yeah. Not in the true wild. <laughs> 
Scott Schuyler is a member of the Upper Skagit Indian tribe. The Skagit River is the heart of their homeland and flows westward through the mountains and the park here. Scott's been the natural resources policy representative for his tribe for over 30 years. Would you like to? Oh, yes, definitely. I would love to see uh, a wolf or even better, you know, a young wolf. <laughs> yeah, establishing a part yeah, of family yeah, up here. Yeah. I've asked for Scott's perspective because the Upper Skagit people were the only tribe who lived on this land before it became North Cascades National Park. I've seen a lot of things disappear in my tenure here. Um, I've seen the salmon decline. I've seen the elk decline. The, the, the elk have came back. And so the fishers are coming back. And hopefully I'll see the, the wolves uh, sustain themselves and, and grow here. It's got it all here, right? You know, from the, yep. the mountain goats in the mountains to the fish in the river, which is right here, the Skagit. Yep, it's a beautiful place. And when the first settlers came to this area and started occupying these areas, they chose the very same places for the very same reasons that uh, my ancestors did. Literally, every city was once an upper Skagit village. Hmm. And, uh, and the United States Army came up here and tried to forcibly relocate us into reservations, but our people refused. And so we were very fortunate to stay in the upper Skagit Valley. This was long before the park, over 100 years before. Back then, his tribe pushed the white settlers back. It's said that more than 100 canoes of people met with settlers to protest the seizure of their lands, to defend their homeland. It was, and still is, a complex dynamic, born of tense history. But the United States government took ownership of this land in 1855, when the Native American tribes of Washington Territory signed the Point Elliott Treaty. Eventually, they accepted a land settlement. It was very unfortunate, but our people uh, accepted a settlement. And what did that mean? What did that make happen? Well, basically, it was um, a, a payment for the loss of our lands here. And basically, the offer was the value of land at 1855 or something like that. It was 90 cents an acre. And it's just crazy that, you know. But, you know, understanding at the time, our people were uh, impoverished. And uh, even though it's not a lot of money, it was a little bit of money, which they didn't have at the time. So like to get that one back but <laughs> yeah our people were always in survival mode and and we couldn't vocalize on behalf of the environment and on behalf of the river on behalf of the wolves when you're trying to live so for 90 cents an acre they accepted a final settlement payment for the loss of half a million acres of land that settlement happened 113 years after the initial signing of the treaty, and in that same year, a portion of those lands became North Cascades National Park, limiting their traditional access to hunt, fish, and gather even more. Because it is a park, you know, that's not possible. But, you know, more importantly, having a management say uh, on, uh, on wildlife and fish is just as important. Mm -hmm. Right. A place at the table as much as anything is what's needed, right? Yeah, and, and uh, be able to uh, vocalize, you know, what we need to, to say about the environment. Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility, do you think? Do you see that in the future where the, 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 the tribal voice is stronger and has more influence? You know, I would hope so uh, someday in a, a utopian world where the tribe has the final word, I guess, if you, on, on environmental issues. I, I hope someday that would be the case because uh, I think we'd all be a lot better off for it. This was our home, and and we should be treated accordingly, and currently it's not the case. <laughs> We're treated as a visitor, if you would. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty straightforward standpoint, isn't it? You know, To us it's clear, yes. <laughs> What would you want people to know about wolves? I guess, uh, you know, from from my you know personal standpoint, just understand that they do belong here, um, just as we belong here this very day, and uh, they have a, a unique role, you know, in our history. Anything that we lose in the environment, natural environment, is our loss, and and we have an obligation to to fix things. Because we're all better off, at least from my perspective, if you would, uh, with them here, with a complete environment, with a functioning river. 
You know what strikes me is, uh, I don't know Jason very well, but we spent the whole day with him yesterday. Um, and he talks exactly that way. Oh, good. good. All of the moving parts and his connection with the place and mm-hmm. the species there. And it's not about one species or another. It's about this animal community. It was very... There are lots of parallels, and it's interesting because he is the federal government and you're the tribe, but you both are speaking the same language, you know. It's clear that Scott and Jason have way more than could unite them than separate them. But the truth is, there's only so much each of them can do. Yeah, we just have different uh, abilities, I guess, or, or that, you know, we have to adhere to. Uh... Yeah, yeah. We're pretty sure this is, yeah, that's where we cross, right? Oh, yeah, we kind of, it blew out. This was the shore right here. Back on the trail with Jason, and the trail has, well, it's ended. <laughs> A river cascading down from the mountains cuts across our route. I think, I mean, the bank used to come all the way up to this route wide. That was the end. Like, the trail was right here. Right. Uh, but this, you know, new channel opened up. As it does, everything moves here. Jason says the water's only up to our knees, but it's rushing hard enough to risk throwing us off our feet. So we cautiously step in and slowly begin to cross. The trick is to look where you're stepping, put a foot in and make sure it's not gonna move. Put your weight on it and then take the next one. That's the strongest current right there. And just angle up into it. It takes us a while, but eventually we finally make it to the other side. There's no human trail from here, just a game trail, bushwhacking along a faint path created by wild animals that use it year after year. watch your step because we're off trail now so the snow hides lots of obstacles yeah like I just sunk oh yeah sunk in between the logs there five miles in and I'm very excited because we're now very close to Jason's camera how did he decide to put the camera in that spot I always look at the bigger landscape. I usually first go to like a Google Earth or something and look at where the landscape pinches together, where there's fewer and fewer options. Wolves use habitat at what ecologists call the landscape level. Not small parcels of land, they need space. So it's important for Jason to look at the landscape that way too. Like a bridge crossing a creek. Like a bridge crossing, (laughs) or here where it narrows the canyon walls come down and narrow quite a lot. And so if you're an animal trying to get up or down this river valley, you're probably gonna jump on this particular trail or you're gonna be on the river bar. Jason tells me he loves to get into the mind of a wolf cruising through its new landscape. If I was a wolf, which way would I go? His mind reading led him to a tree on a game trail by the river, just hoping the camera would be successful. I was like, I feel really good about this. There's some boulders. Like, this is a great place to walk through this one little narrow slot. Mm. And we got 600 pictures of wolves there. What? So they just kept coming and going. So no matter how they wanted to go up and down the river, they had to go through that little spot. Finally, we arrive at the camera location. So you're about to walk right in front of it. Oh. Turn around and smile. It's just 600 feet from where I found my wolf tracks. What are the chances of that? Well, maybe pretty good. And is this camera, you put these out specifically for the wolves? Right, this is just for wolf monitoring to see what's going on. So I'll just... uh... The camera is inside a small green metal box, but the edges are glued tight by the ice and snow. All right, so this one's a little frozen, so I'm just gonna... So Jason pulls out a lighter to melt the lock a bit. Flash the lighter in the lock there. There we go. 
needles in there. There's 341 pictures on there. Oh. We crouch down in the snow, too excited to get comfortable. Jason connects the SD card to his phone and flips through the pictures. It's astounding to see how many different animals have walked this wolf path in the past couple of months. Spotted skunk, western spotted skunk. Very cool find. That's actually a really exciting find for here. That's the species that we think is declining here. Then we've got a black bear walking nice. through. Not so fast through the bears. Bobcat. Whoa, cool. There's our deer. Healthy looking. A lot of deer traffic. That's always a good sign. Yeah. And there's a cougar. Cougar. Yeah. Wow. Oh, look at that beautiful cat. All of them have got their nose to the ground here, right? They do, yeah. They're all smelling each other go by. One time, another deer. More deer. That's a good sign. If there's that many deer around, then mm -hmm. that definitely is a good sign for wolves to be in the neighborhood. But as we get to the end, sadly, there are no wolves on the camera. Nope. No wolves. Yet. I'll say yet. So, what does it tell you that there's no wolf on this camera? Uh, only that they're not here right now. You know, this camera's only been out for a couple months, and this is an extremely low-density species. 13,500 square miles. It's almost a lot of space to look for a couple wolves. It makes me feel good about the tracks I found. Yeah, you should feel good about them. You don't find them every day. What does it tell you that there were so many different species that were, were caught on that camera, you know, that, that we're seeing? Generally gives me the impression that you know, the ecosystem's doing well. When you see biodiversity like that, especially large mammals, you know, not only did we see cougar and bobcat and deer and black bear, we also saw the bush-tailed wood rat and Douglas squirrels. And we've been seeing snowshoe hare tracks all along the trail. The trophic levels are there and the animals are thriving. There's carnivores thriving. That's a good sign. All these creatures make up what's known in ecology as a community, defined as a group of species that are commonly found together. Wolves depend on deer. Deer are now learning to deal with the new wolves, dusting off old synapses as they kind of remember what a wolf is and start to move around to avoid being eaten. Cougars now compete with wolves, and both of them provide food from their kills for hundreds of species, from ravens to beetles and bears. It's a place that's finding a new equilibrium after being out of whack for so many decades. It's time to turn around, but not before I take a little detour to glass the sandy riverbed with my binoculars. No tracks. They gotta be somewhere else, huh? Somewhere else in that wide Today, open they're wilderness. somewhere else, but you know, we'll check the camera next next spring and you never know. Yeah. Never know what's on there. Before we leave the park, my producer Lucy and I want to do one more thing. We've been talking about how, despite all the complexities of the history here, Jason from the park and Scott from the tribe share common goals for this place and its wildlife. So we invite them to meet. Are we yeah. inside here? We are, but we have to wait for Jason to come unlock it. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay, well, early. I got out of the car a little premature then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stay warm in there. No, no worries. And, and it's another frosty morning, and I'm with Scott in a little town called New Halem, in the park, waiting for Jason to arrive. Does it feel like you're coming home when you get into New oh, Halem? Yeah. yeah, this was a, 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 we had our village site right there, and um, this was a, a goat hunting area for us where we collect goat wool and in fact there's some ancestral hunting blinds just uh, down the road here that are thousands of years old that are still intact. No way. Yeah. Jason arrives and unlocks the government oh, building. It has dorm rooms for park staff and researchers. We squeeze into one of the tiny dorm rooms with wooden walls and dusty bed frames. We get settled in. Put us on the spot here. I know. Yeah, yeah. I don't want it to feel like that at all. Yeah. And then I jump right in with the big question that has been on my mind since I got here. Do you think, is, is there a chance for the tribe to collaborate with the park service through wolves? Yeah, we're totally excited and open to having those conversations. Yeah, I think so. I think... There's lots of opportunity for coach stewardship where we have like very similar values and goals and we can work around some of the bureaucracy to actually do the important stuff. 
Um, I'm coming from a place of ignorance here, but why is it not already happening? I'm curious about, like, why is that relationship not established and, and working? That, that's a great, uh, great question. You know, uh, we can go to the trustee and, and bring our concerns, issues, if you would. But ultimately, currently, the Park Service has the management authority. Uh, we don't. And so we have to be invited in to participate. And But this, you know, w- wolf recovery is a great opportunity where we can build on that and start developing a management uh, agreement, if you would, hopefully someday where, you know, we could be a partner, an active partner, which is what we'd like to do. Yeah, that's exactly what we'd like to do, too. I asked Scott and Jason, what would it be like if these West Slope wolves stay, if they make a permanent home in North Cascades National Park? You know, I would feel like I've lived a complete life if, if I could hear a wolf howl or see a wolf. That would be amazing. I hope that the ecosystem remembers them. When they come back and they carve their way back into this ecosystem that's continued to evolve without them, I hope they find the rhythm that they need to thrive. To thrive is to heal. And it takes time to overcome the trauma that has played out on this land that is now the North Cascades National Park. It's a stunning, magnificent, wild place. But it was broken after years of ecological neglect and abuse as animals and humans were exterminated and pushed out. But slowly, things are changing. People are talking. The community is being rebuilt. Wildlife is returning to this sanctuary. In many cases, one species at a time. The wolverine, the fisher, perhaps the grizzly bear and now the wolf, often down to the sheer grit and resilience of one pioneering individual. And if he is still around, my black wolf will be getting old for a wild wolf. He'd be about eight years old by now. But one thing is for sure, he has forged a path that other wolves will continue to follow back home to the western side of these magnificent mountains. This season of the wild is about the incredible biodiversity in our national parks. From the tallest trees on the planet to the driest deserts and everything in between. And it's about the people working in and around our national parks to protect the natural world while we still can. If you like what you hear, share it. Tell a friend about the podcast or leave us a rating and review. It really helps. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe. It's free and easy. And as always, there are some great photographs and clips from our journey through the national parks on Instagram at The Wild Pod and mine at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and Chris Morgan Wildlife with support from Wildlife Media. This show would not be possible without listener support. And you can help us to continue to create this special immersive storytelling by donating to KUOW. Go to KUOW.org slash donate slash The Wild. Thank you. Our producer is Lucy Suchek. Jim Gates is our editor. It's hosted, produced, and written by me, Chris Morgan. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Bob Yellowlees, Barbara Stolman, and Barton Brooks. Our production team includes David Brown, April Craig, Marshall Eisen, Michaela Jarty boyle Tatiana Latre, Matt Martin, Kara McDermott, Amelia Peacock, Darcy Riggin Schmidt, Brendan Sweeney, and Hans Twite. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. Additional music by Carly Burke, also known as Arsis Marty. I'm Chris Morgan. As always, take care of yourselves and do what you can to take care of our beautiful planet. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>